very much, Zachary, and everyone else here for a very kind invitation to speak to your interesting group. Um, I should preface my remarks in a couple of ways. One, uh, although I am in New Zealand for three weeks uh, as a Fulbright scholar, which is, that is at the, at the, with the support of the American government, uh, I don't speak for the American government. Like any other person in that capacity, I simply have ideas that I share with audiences in academic settings. Um, second point is the original version of this talk, well, which is real close to what you'll hear today, was prepared for the Darwin Bicentennial. Um, you guys probably know that Charles Darwin was born in 2000, well, 1809, and so 2009 was the bicentennial year. And in America, particularly, that was a big deal because Charles Darwin and Abraham Lincoln were born on exactly the same day of the same year. And, and uh, so a lot, of, a lot of learned societies in the United States did one or the other or both. And the American Academy of Religion, which ironically that year didn't meet in America, it met in Montreal, Canada, um, had a, a, centennial, a bicentennial session on Darwin and religion. So I was assigned the title Darwin and religion. I was asked to give the address for that, and then a couple of theologians, namely Sarah Coakley, of, of then of Harvard, now of Cambridge, uh, or Oxford, responded to that, and so did Susan Thibble-Twait from Chicago Theological Seminary. And so that was the setting. This was originally written for scholars of religion, which would have included people in religious studies, people in theology, people in some other fields. And uh, as a historian of science, I'm a historian of science, I was definitely an interloper in that group, coming at them from a very different discipline. And my overall question was, you know, what would a scholar of the history of science have to say to scholars of religion? So this was an address in that setting, and almost all of what you'll hear is the same that they heard. I actually just put a little bit more material in tonight, because I have a little bit more time uh, to address the topic. Okay, so let me, with that said, let me start. I'm going to begin with three quotations, at least one of which you're probably very familiar with. You might have heard of two of them. I'd be surprised if you've heard all three, but I'm going to, that, that are quite different from one another. Here's the first, from Richard Dawkins. Although atheism might have been logically tenable before Darwin, Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. Second quotation from William Jennings Bryan. Um, he was the former presidential candidate in the United States, three-time candidate for president on the Democratic Party at the end of the 19th, early 20th century. Very, very liberal Democrat. In fact, he was a socialist at one point. Um, and he, uh, he was also staunchly opposed to the teaching of evolution in America uh, and through publicly funded schools. He led the anti-evolution crusade in the 1920s that culminated in the famous Scopes trial. So that's the context for him. Theistic evolution may be described as an anesthetic which deadens the pain while the patient's religion is being gradually removed, or a way station on the highway that leads from Christian faith to no God land. Now, this third individual I'm going to quote is probably not known to anyone in the room here, not likely, but he was the most influential theological educator in the United States at the time of the Scopes trial. He was the dean of the Divinity School at the University of Chicago. His name was Shaler Matthews. And he, the um, University of Chicago was a very liberal Protestant seminary at that time, and still is today. And it produced more doctoral students than any other seminary in America at that point. So it was very influential on in what was being taught at other seminaries and what was being preached in churches. And Shaler Matthews, in his autobiography, New Faith for All, makes the following statement. When Henry Ward Beecher and other liberal preachers accepted evolution, their evangelical brothers looked upon them with suspicion. Scientific method had not reached religious thought. It was only when educational processes had ceased to be controlled by the study of classical literature and grew more contemporary that orthodox theology was felt to be incompatible with intellectual integrity. Now, the quotations I have just read encapsulate the point I want to explore. Charles Darwin's theory of evolution has led many people, some of them deeply religious and some of them deeply anti-religious, to conclude that modern science is at war with religion. 
especially but not only with Christianity, such that believing in evolution leads almost inevitably to atheism, or at least that evolution makes traditional Christian doctrine untenable. Although Darwin himself denied that his theory was necessarily atheistical, as he said, he probably came to think that a respectful agnosticism was the best that one could do. At least it was the best that he could do. Let each man hope and believe what he can, Darwin told the first American Darwinian, Harvard botanist Asa Gray, who was also the first theistic evolutionist of the Darwinian type. Since then, a lot of men, and many women as well, have hoped and believed what they could, and my assignment is to try to make sense of that. What then does Darwin mean for religion? More precisely, since I'm an historian rather than a theologian or a philosopher, what has Darwin been said to mean for religion? What might a historian of science have to say about this uh, to an audience of others who are not in my own discipline, who don't share my disciplinary background and conversation? Well, as you might know, um, it is actually my own discipline, the history of science, that has led the way in debunking the very prevalent cultural myth that science and religion are engaged in an ongoing inevitable conflict, with science winning the war for cultural and epistemic territory. Although the conflict view ultimately derives from the European Enlightenment, its most influential expression was actually American. This is one of those cases where you can judge the books by their covers, or at least by their titles. In 1874, chemist John William Draper, who taught at what is now known as New York University, published his History of the Conflict Between Religion and Science. And in 1896, the first president of Cornell University, Andrew Dixon White, published A History of the Warfare of Science with Theology in Christendom. It's hard to say which one of these is actually worse in terms of its scholarship, but my vote goes to White. Although he was the first president of the American Historical Association, White seems to have consulted original sources about as often as he watched television. Consequently, his book is full of manufactured facts, quote unquote, invented or misattributed quotations, and unsupportable interpretations. Draper is not a great deal better, yet both, both books remain widely influential today, perhaps partly because the shoddy scholarship and outright nonsense they contain is central to the apologetics of contemporary unbelief. Why else would White's contribution to historical fiction be available for free download at infidels.org and Draper's book at positiveatheism.org? Now much of my own scholarly work has been based on debunking the conflict view while helping to create a more accurate history of science and Christianity. So why then have I begun this talk by quoting three examples that illustrate the presence of apparent conflict between science and Christian belief? Well, in short, because many have perceived conflict over evolution. To be sure, other things have also taken place which contradict the warfare view, and I will come back to this. But conflict has been perhaps the primary mode of interaction in this particular case. Historically, there have been four main patterns that still govern most religious responses to evolution today. And you will notice, by the way, that I'm including an atheist response as a religious response. I mean, one could dispute that, but that's how I see it. Um, one is conflict, resulting in the rejection of evolution as valid science. A second is conflict resulting in the outright rejection of most types of theism as contradictory to science. A third is conflict, resulting in the rejection of divine transcendence and the wholesale reformulation of traditional theological beliefs. This is a, a much of the liberal Christian response, in other words. Um, it's something that looks more like a monologue to me than a dialogue, although it's often called a dialogue. And finally, complementarity in which traditional theological beliefs are upheld alongside a full acceptance of modern science, either by putting those beliefs into a higher realm that is separate from scientific conclusions, 
or else by affirming them alongside scientific conclusions in what looks to me more like genuine dialogue than any of the other patterns. I want to look now at a few specific examples of each of these four kinds of responses. Let me begin with conflict resulting in the rejection of evolution. This is the one that's very often associated with the word fundamentalist. Now, interestingly, as you probably know, the word fundamentalist has many, many uses today, and used in many different contexts. Even, in fact, the late Stephen Jay Gould, uh, the famous Harvard biologist, described some of his own scientific colleagues as being fundamentalists in science in a certain way, uh, because of attitudes they held. But the original use of this word was in an American context and a particular religious context. It was actually first given a definition in July of 1920. And that definition was given by um, a, uh, a Baptist editor of a magazine called the Watchman Examiner. And his name was Curtis Laws. And the passage I'm going to really highlight here is, is going to be this one from the column in which he gave this word a definition. He said that it was, uh, he was looking for a word to describe himself and like-minded friends of his who wanted to make a very conservative response to liberal religious trends from the late 19th century, particularly to defend traditional uh, Christian beliefs which he described as the great fundamentals. And he said, we'd suggest that those who still cling to the great fundamentals and who mean to do battle royal for the fundamentals shall be called fundamentalists. That's the first use of the word in print that historians are aware of. So it has both this content to it of people who want to preserve traditional views, but who also want to do so by contesting, taking on those who want to change. Now, the people over and against and against um, this group. This group defined itself over against an other group, and the other group was calling themselves modernists. That's what they were calling themselves. Late 19th century uh, liberal Protestants who decided to call themselves modernists because they wanted to accommodate to modern knowledge and culture in certain ways. Um, and their conservative opponents are the ones who call themselves fundamentalists. So the terms modernist and fundamentalist were self-chosen labels for these two opposing groups in the American religious scene. Now, issues involving science were particularly contentious. Coming to a head in the 1925 show trial of John Scopes for teaching evolution in a Tennessee high school. Incidentally, in that show trial, everyone in the room, including the defendant, wanted a conviction. The, the purpose of that, say it was a show trial, uh, Scopes himself as a substitute science teacher wasn't even sure he taught evolution, uh, but he, they wanted to convict someone for teaching evolution intentionally in order to try the constitutionality of the law itself. Uh, and so that the initial trial was a set case um, with everyone hoping for a conviction. In fact, even the uh, attorney defending John Scopes, Clarence Darrow, was concerned at the end that maybe the jury might not find him guilty. He asked the judge to make sure the jury found him guilty. Okay? But I could tell you a lot about that, but that's not my topic tonight. William Jennings Bryan, the fundamentalist leader who assisted the prosecution, whom I've already quoted here this afternoon, said, as I quoted above, that theistic evolution was an anesthetic which deadens the pain while the patient's religion is being gradually removed thus shortcoming any serious attempt at productive conversation. As Brian told the editor of a fundamentalist magazine, evolution was the cause of modernism and the progressive elimination of the vital truths of the Bible. That's what Brian said about it. The Christian who accepted evolution, in his opinion, would almost inevitably descend a staircase of increasing unbelief on which there was no stopping place as are Brian's words, no stopping place short of atheism. Um, that's a vivid image that a fundamentalist cartoonist, a former political cartoonist from Chicago, and Ernest James Pace, soon converted into this particular cartoon that you see here. Now, this cartoon was first published in, actually the date should be 1924, it's a mistake on my slide, um, to a frontispiece uh, of a work of William Jennings Bryan's called Seven Questions in Dispute. And it shows what, in Brian's view, 
what evolution would do uh, to Christian belief. A student with a Bible in his hand, stepping from the step saying, Bible is not infallible to man is not made in God's image. A minister stepping from no deity, that means no deity of Jesus, to no atonement. And a scientist stepping from agnosticism to atheism. This is how Brian set up this cartoon in a letter he wrote to the editor of the um, publishing house that produced this book. And so for Brian, even though these were drawn as steps, it was a slippery slope. As he said, there is no stopping place on this. Now, now two of Brian's concerns about evolution are illustrated here. His fear that evolution undermined biblical authority and thereby Christian doctrines, and his fear that evolution represented the nose of the camel of naturalism entering the tent of a religion founded on supernatural events. This latter concern about naturalism is evident in another cartoon by the same cartoonist um, that you see here. This is the idea that if people, if scientists particularly, but also biblical scholars, if they assume that miracles can never happen, they will dismiss any, any evidence, any amount of evidence uh, for the miracles of Christ, for example. And this mounts then to a form of being science falsely so-called. I, I won't go into that tonight, uh, this afternoon. It's a long story, that science falsely so-called term. I can answer questions about it after if you like. But in Brian's opinion, and the opinion of most fundamentalists at the time, true science had to be distinguished from false science. And true science never wears blinders, as this cartoon has it. Never assumes that miracles are absolutely impossible. And modern creationists echo Brian on both of these points about evolution being the, the cause of a descent of, 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 from religious belief into atheism and of evolution inappropriately uh, ruling out the possibility of miracles. So I'm going to skip over that now uh, without further comment. Brian also believed uh, that evolution had led to cutthroat capitalism in America. I mentioned before that he was essentially a socialist for much of his political career. Uh, he believed, for example, in the public ownership of banks. He just didn't live long enough to see that in the United States. Um, and also, uh, he had believed it was responsible for chauvinistic nat nationalism and militarism in Germany uh, before World War I. I. I don't have time to sketch that fairly. I can come back to that at the end if you want. But suffice it to say for Brian that it was the religious liberals, uh, not the fundamentalists, who were keen on eugenics and other forms of social Darwinism during the Scopes era. In fact, Ben Stein's recent film, Expelled, which many of you may be familiar with, tried to connect Darwin directly to Hitler in a way that reminds me of Brian's concerns. Now, other religious objections to evolution need to be mentioned. The leading American theologian of the 19th century, Charles Hodge, professor at Princeton, said in 1874 that Darwinism is atheism. That's the term he used. Specifically because natural selection denies design. Philip Johnson, the founder of the modern intelligent design movement, says precisely the same thing. But even pre-Darwinian forms of evolution, forms of evolution that were clearly and deeply teleological, that were purpose-driven forms of evolution, um, were sometimes said to be atheistic and seen as threatening to Christianity. Like Brian, some critics of those theories believed that biological continuity between humans and other animals threatened the idea of the image of God and undermined the basis for morality. Thus, for example, Adam Sedgwick, who taught uh, who took Darwin on his geological field trips at Cambridge and taught Darwin about the young science of stratigraphy, identifying various geological layers. Really, Darwin's first teacher in geology. And Darwin began his career in geology, not in biology. Um, Sedgwick responded to a publication from 1844 called The Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation which was an early, very non-scientific form of evolution. And Sedgwick responded to this in the following words. He said, if the book be true, he told Charles Lyell, the geologist, if the book be true, the labors of sober induction are in vain. Religion is a lie. 
Human law is a mass of folly and a base injustice. Morality is moonshine. Our labors for the black people of Africa were works of madmen. He's referring there to the end of the slave trade. And man and woman are only better beasts. Also, the enormously popular Scottish evangelical writer, Hugh Miller, who wrote 10,000 words a week for uh, various publications that he edited, um, saw a common ancestry of humans and other animals as a frontal assault on immortality. If humans are continuous with animals, he wrote, we must believe either the monstrous belief that all the vitalities, all the living things, are individually and inherently immortal and undying, or that human souls are not so. The difference between the dying and the undying, between the spirit of the brute that goes down and the spirit of the man that goes up, is not a difference infinitesimally or even atomically small. It possesses all the breadth of eternity to come and is an infinitely great distance. In America, the famous Hebrew scholar Taylor Lewis of Union College wrote that Chambers' book, this same book, is atheism, blank atheism, cold, cheerless, heartless atheism, because it seemed to undermine special providence and divine moral governance of the universe. And Edward Hitchcock, the president of Amherst College and a great geologist, before the war, had the same view. He said, we are reduced at once to materialism and atheism, all responding to Robert Chambers, a teleological form of evolution years before Darwin. Lewis and Hitchcock would agree entirely with Oxford zoologist Richard Dawkins if they were living today. So well known are the best-selling books by Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, Daniel Dennett, Sam Harris, and others that no one who pays attention either to the culture wars or to religion can possibly have missed them. Collectively, they have become known as the new atheists. And I think in some ways that's an appropriate term. Although the rejection of theism on the basis of evolution is not entirely new, I can't think of any historical precedent for the plethora of books and articles we're now seeing, aggressively advancing what I can only call an evangelical atheism on the back of evolution. Indeed, in my opinion, this is a new form of the religion of science. That's a term that's been used in the United States since at least 1860 to mean various different things. And I'll provide a specific example of it a little bit later on. Now, of course, Dawkins denies that he's doing religion. But, of course, he really is. As Carl Guyverson and the late Mariano Artigas have shown, Dawkins and several other scientists who write for large audiences are functioning effectively as oracles of science, that's their term, oracles of science, offering readers precisely what religion has always offered, a creation story, a view of our place in the universe, an eschatology, that is a view of things to come, and a guide for our behavior. Now, it is not simply that Dawkins and company believe that evolution makes God obsolete, or even that the sort of God compatible with Darwinian evolution would have to be what Dawkins has called a blind watchmaker. As Terry Eagleton points out, Dawkins holds that the existence or non-existence of God is a scientific hypothesis, which is open to rational demonstration. And given the conclusion that he draws, Dawkins functions effectively as a natural atheologian. That is someone who, uh, the devil's chaplain, as he styles himself. And for thinkers in this category, there might not be any thinkers at all in any other category, since only they are the brights, as explained by philosopher Daniel Dennett. Dennett says, what is a bright? A bright is a person with a naturalist as opposed to a supernaturalist worldview. We brights don't believe in ghosts or elves or the Easter Bunny or God. Now, the views of the new atheists are what most scholars probably have in mind when they speak of the warfare of science and religion. Now, their particular version of the warfare view is more virulent and more vociferous than the kind of view I already introduced you to a little bit earlier, the view of A.D. White, White's subtler and gentler version, and therefore it's more readily visible. Yet White's version has actually been far more influential on the modern dialogue despite the fact that its subtler posture 
has not really been much gentler in its effect on traditional Christian beliefs. The late Stephen Jay Gould understood better than most others precisely what White's warfare thesis was really about. As Gould wrote in his book, Rocks of Ages, White did not formulate his thesis about warfare between religion and science primarily to advance the cause of science, but rather to save religion from its own internal enemies, which White, with Gould's obvious approval, saw as, quote, dogmatic theology, that combination of terms. Um, the term dogmatic in White's book is never applied to science, even if scientists can be dogmatic. It's only applied to theology, and the term is always a pejorative. Now, Gould was right. White did not want science completely to eradicate religion. That is, he did not want science to do what Richard Dawkins would like science to do. A careful reading of the title of White's book indicates this. His book, let me remind you, was called The History of the Warfare of Science with Theology in Christendom. He thought theology, that is abstract thinking about God, formalized doctrine. Theology, not religion more broadly, was the source of the problem. White wanted only to see the ice of dogmatic theology mount, mount inexorably and quietly into the mighty river of advancing scientific knowledge. Now that memorable image comes from the flowery preface that White wrote for, White wrote for his book. While he was American minister, to Russia, old Tsarist Russia, in St. Petersburg. Wright, White finished the preface to his book in the early 1890s, while he was our ambassador to Tsarist Russia. And he was based in St. Petersburg, that old city on the River Neva, which freezes over every winter, and then thaws again in the spring. Please listen as I read for, here's the Neva in the, river, in the winter. Okay, so get this picture in your mind. And I will now read a few paragraphs from White's preface. This is the preface from his book, A History of the Warfare of Science with Theology in Christendom. And when, as I read it, I think you'll see exactly what White meant by the warfare of science with theology. My book is ready for the printer. And as I begin this preface, my light eye lights upon the crowd of Russian peasants at work on the Neva under my windows. With pick and shovel, they are letting the rays of the April sun into the great ice barrier, which binds together the modern keys and the old granite fortress where lie the bones of the Romanov Tsars. That's the opening two sentences to this historical study. Sounds more like a novel, doesn't it? This barrier is already weakened. It is widely decayed, in many places thin, and everywhere treacherous. But it is, as a whole, so broad, so crystallized about old boulders, so embedded in shallows, so wedged into crannies on either shore, that it is a great danger. The waters from thousands of swollen streamlets above are pressing behind it. Wreckage and refuse are piling up against it. Everyone knows that it must yield. But there is danger that it may resist the pressure too long and break suddenly, wrenching even the granite keys from their foundations, bringing desolation to a vast population and leaving after the subsidence of the flood a widespread residue of slime, a fertile breeding bed for the germs of disease. Now, I'm going to continue with the last two paragraphs in a moment, but just to, we're all on the same page. The picture that White is presenting to us based on this imagery here, of course, is that the ice barrier is theology, and the rising river behind it is science. But the patient mujiks are doing the right thing. The barrier, exposed more and more to the warmth of the spring by the scores of channels they're making, will break away gradually, and the river will flow on beneficent and beautiful. My work in this book is like that of the Russian mujik on the Neva. I simply try to aid in letting the light of historical truth into that decaying mass of outworn thought which attaches the modern world to medieval conceptions of Christianity, and which still lingers among us, a most serious barrier to religion and morals, and a menace to the whole normal evolution of society. Okay, now, earlier today I gave a different talk in which I talked in some detail about what modern historians of science almost unanimously think 
about this warfare view of science and religion. I haven't time to go into that this afternoon. You can ask me about it later if you want. The bottom line is it's been completely discarded. It's an utterly useless construction today for writing the history of science and religion. So I'll pick up again with my text. We now know that White could hold such a view only by constructing a false history of Christianity and science. Yet his influence on subsequent thinkers has been nothing short of profound. Even those who deny that science and religion are engaged in an ongoing inevitable conflict often agree with the warfare view as White understood it. Namely, that traditional theology has proved utterly unable to engage science in fruitful conversation. And therefore, we must now fully reformulate our theological understanding of the world in order to fully embrace modern science. At this point, I'd like us to recall what Shaler Matthews said in the opening statement I, I quoted about the impact of science on religion. As he put it, orthodox theology was felt to be incompatible with intellectual integrity. Well, Matthews was a member of the Hyde Park Baptist Church in Chicago, near the University of Chicago, on the south side of Chicago. That's now called Hyde Park Union Church. It was a very interesting congregation at that time. One of his fellow members, for example, was Nobel laureate physicist Arthur Holly Compton, whom I spoke about um, out at Laidlaw College on, on Thursday night. Uh, another member there was the intellectual historian Edwin Arthur Burt, um, who taught in various places, including uh, Columbia, in his career. Burt was a signer of the Humanist Manifesto of 1933. That is, Burt, in other words, was a secular humanist. He was probably not a theist at all. He was a member of this particular church. And at one point in his book called Religion in an Age of Science, Burt had the following observation about the so-called conflict of science and religion, historical conflict. It's a fascinating observation about, I think, some of his fellow travelers at this church. How much can I still believe, is the question pathetically asked. Beginning with two score or more doctrinal articles, there ensues a process of elimination and attenuation, till today, in liberal circles, the minimum creed seems to have been reduced to three tenths. Belief in God, confidence in immortality, and conviction of spiritual uniqueness in Jesus of Nazareth. Thus the pathetic game of give what must, hold what can, continues. Burt was clearly cynical about this process. Uh, someone else like uh, Arthur Holly Compton, the physicist in the church, that would have described his set of beliefs perfectly. Now all of this resonates with the conclusions of Princeton embryologist Edwin Grant Conklin. Uh, you probably have not heard of him here in modern New Zealand, but if you've been alive in America in the 1920s and 30s and reading things you likely would have, here he was on the cover of Time magazine in the late 1930s. He was a biologist hired at Princeton by Princeton President Woodrow Wilson, who later became President of the United States. And Conklin was a leading public intellectual. He wrote for all the major opinion magazines about science. He himself slowly gave up his Christian beliefs as he accepted scientific naturalism. And he saw his own spiritual journey as one he said that orthodox friends, his words, might interpret as descending steps, those are his language, leading him further from the Methodist faith of his youth. My gradual loss of, uh, it's impossible for me to read this, uh, in fact, without thinking of that cartoon we saw about the steps earlier. My gradual loss of faith in many orthodox beliefs he recalled near the end of his life, came inevitably with increasing knowledge of nature and growth of critical sense. Especially important in this regard was his reading of White and Draper. These two books, he said, showed the impossibility of harmonizing many traditional doctrines of theology with the demonstrations of modern science. That's what he thought. Thus, it was no longer possible for him to be religious in a traditional sense. And when he lectured a Philadelphia audience on the religion of science in the mid-1920s, he identified the essential contents of his faith by denying a personal God, denying miracles, denying supernatural revelation, denying immortality, etc. Conklin's former student, Samuel Christian Schmucker, who was a grandson of the most famous American Lutheran theologian of the 19th century, is another example. 
Today, he's almost unknown. But in the early 20th century, he was a nationally prominent popularizer of evolution and eugenics. In a pamphlet that he wrote that was published and widely circulated by the people in Chicago, by Shaler Matthews and the people in Chicago, a shirt pocket sized tract, okay, a religious tract, part of a series on science and religion, published in 1926. Schmucker said that the laws of nature which had produced evolution were, quote, not the fiat of Almighty God. Rather, they were the manifestation in nature of the presence of the indwelling God. Thus, they were eternal, even as God is eternal. Gravitation, for example, he said, is inherent in the nature of bodies. It was not put there by a higher power. He apparently hasn't read Isaac Newton lately, because Newton's view was precisely the opposite of this. Casting aside all vestiges of a transcendent creator in favor of a wholly imminent God, he constructed an evolutionary theism that made God and the world equally old, that is coeval, is the term for this, and indistinguishable from the laws of nature and the evolutionary progress they had produced. It's hardly surprising to me that Schmucker was an advocate of eugenics, which he saw as the means by which humans could work with the imminent God to eliminate sinful behaviors. Now, in light of the examples I've just offered, it's not hard to agree with the observations of the leading contemporary scholar of science and religion, Ian Barber, that the modernists, quote, emphasized God's imminence, often to the virtual exclusion of transcendence. And in some cases, God was viewed as a force within a cosmic process that was itself divine. Yet the views and attitudes of these modernists, their attitude was that which is not scientific ought no longer to be affirmed by the Christian theologian, would fit perfectly into the intellectual world of today. As David Ray Griffin, uh, a prominent California theologian, has noted, modern liberal theologies have achieved a reconciliation of science with theology at the expense of its religious content. Not everyone, however, has fallen victim to warfare thinking. John Polkinghorne has seen perhaps more clearly than anyone else the ongoing influence of White's attitude in modern theology. As he has said, the scientific avenue into theological thinking will seek to give due weight to science, but it would be fatal to allow it to become a scientific takeover bid, offering no more than a religious gloss on a basic naturalistic account. Now let me ad lib a bit and introduce you uh, to John Polkinghorne, if he's someone you don't know. Um, he's now uh, 81 years old, so most of what he's written, I assume, has already been written. Um, he's an Englishman um, who uh, was a professor of physics at Cambridge for many years, a colleague of Stephen Hawking, um, among others. And then, at the height of his career in physics, at age 49, he abandoned, he resigned from his position as professor of Cambridge and became an Anglican minister. Um, he's had really then two careers, one as a mathematical physicist and the other as an Anglican priest. He studied at Cambridge himself. He studied applied mathematics rather than pure mathematics. That's what they call it when you study theoretical physics at Cambridge. And his doctoral mentor, uh, after he finished his undergrad degree, he stayed at Cambridge, and his doctoral mentor was actually the first uh, Islamic scientist to receive a Nobel Prize. That's Abdus Salam, the Pakistani physicist, uh, who, as you see, got his Nobel Prize for certain contributions to theoretical uh, physics shown here. And then after this, he went to Caltech in California for a postdoc where he worked under a second famous Nobel laureate, Murray Gilman, the founder of uh, quark theory and uh, then went back to Edin first to Edinburgh and then to Cambridge where he taught for many years. Now, let me introduce you to Polkinghorne's ideas briefly uh, in this way. His overall point, I think, would be this, safely summarized this way. Science, he thinks, cannot provide its own metaphysical interpretation. In other words, science doesn't come with a particular religious interpretation in terms of theism, atheism, or anything else. Science doesn't carry a metaphysical interpretation along with it. There's no obvious metaphysical conclusion from science to anything else. He's put it this way. Physics 
constrains metaphysics. It limits what metaphysics can say. But it, is, but it no more determines it than the foundations of a house determine the precise form of the building erected on them. As he goes on to say, science offers an illuminating context within which much theological reflection can take place. But in its turn, it needs to be considered in the wider and deeper context of intelligibility that a belief in God affords. His case is simply that theology is not science, it's a larger context within which science can fit. Uh, he goes on to say, the universe is not only rationally transparent to us, as as not only can we understand it, but it is also rationally beautiful, rewarding those who investigate it with the experience of wonder at what is disclosed to their inquiry. Perhaps the best way to understand his approach to this whole question is to pick up on three ideas by leading 20th century scientists. One of them is Albert Einstein. Um, Albert Einstein is famous for saying words to this effect. You know, these, these are translated in various ways, but here's a translation I like. The most incomprehensible thing about the world is that it is comprehensible. In other words, why does the world make sense? Or um, Hungarian uh, mathematical physicist Eugene Wigner, um, his bottom line question is here, and he's put it in a, in a, there's a wonderfully interesting essay you should Google sometime and read called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. You may have, might, 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 have, might say in the physical sciences, I might have a misquote of the title there, I'm not sure. Uh, but here's what he said. It is difficult, he's talking about why mathematics is so effective at understanding nature. Why is it so ineffective at understanding nature down deep, down deep in very subtle ways. And what he says is, it is difficult to avoid the impression that a miracle confronts us here, quite comparable in its striking nature to the two miracles of the existence of laws of nature and of the human mind's capacity to divine them. So the second question that Polkinghorne is interested in is that one. Why is mathematics so powerful for understanding nature? And the third question is based on the work of one of his mo most influential teachers, Polkinghorne's commented that the person who was most influential on him at Cambridge was Paul Dirac, a very famous theoretical physicist. Polkinghorne's described him as the greatest theoretical phys English theoretical physicist of the 20th century. That's probably true. Um, Dirac wanted to know this. Dirac put it this way. God used beautiful mathematics in creating the world. This result is too beautiful to be false. It is more important to have beauty in one's equations than to have them fit. Experiment. Dirac was famous for this kind of a priori approach to nature. The mathematics itself had to have beauty if it was to be true. So why is it that beautiful mathematics is just what we need, that kind of mathematics? So if you take those three questions together, you get a sense of where Polkinghorne is coming from. In his view, a theistic perspective makes sense of all three of these things, where science alone doesn't seem to do that very well. Now, finally then, to come back to specific Christian beliefs, not just theism generally, Polkinghorne has noted in, in dialogue with many other people, including fellow Christians, he has pointed out that the resurrection is the pivot on which Christian belief turns. Without it, it seems to me that the story of Jesus' life and its continuing aftermath is not fully intelligible. So he's written. He has another book of his called The Faith of a Physicist, which... Uh, I don't know if it's published in New Zealand or not, specifically. It's published in the US by Princeton University Press and in Britain by another press. Um, in the book, The Faith of a Physicist takes the form of a commentary on the Nicene Creed, one of the two classical, so-called ecumenical creeds of Christianity from the fourth century. And there, Polkinghorne devotes most of a chapter to exploring, quote, whether the belief that God raised Jesus from the dead is one that is credible for us today, unquote. Now along the way, he rejects the view associated with Rudolf Bultmann and others that what happened was only a faith event in the minds of the disciples. And he goes on to place the source of doubt where it actually belongs, uh, not really in science, but in the skepticism of David Hume, the mighty philosopher David Hume, who in Polkinghorne's words, Hume's confidence that the laws of nature were known with a certainty that extends even into realms of unprecedented and hitherto unexplored phenomena is one that was certainly falsified 
by the history of science subsequent to the 18th century. And it could never be pressed to dispose of an event like the resurrection of Jesus, which claims to be a particular act of God in a unique circumstance. I close now then with a paradox. Polky Horn is a modern thinker, but pre-modern enough to appreciate postmodern efforts to demythologize science without embracing complete relativism. In my opinion, he understands better than most other contemporary theologians what my discipline, the history and philosophy of science, has actually done for theology. He not only understands, as many others do, that the so-called warfare model that was uncritically accepted for most of the 20th century is historically bankrupt. He also understands that this fact negates the pseudo-historical underpinning of many modern efforts to demythologize theology in the name of science. Above all, he realizes that one of the most serious consequences of the modern embrace of A.D. White, namely the flight from transcendence, has left theology unable adequately to ground Christian hope and less able to converse productively with science as a partner of equal standing. And finally, in identifying philosopher David Hume, rather than scientist Charles Darwin as the bogeyman, Pokinghorn advances a more helpful conversation between science and religion. Thanks for the opportunity to share these thoughts with you today.